when you decided to create uh, such a personal uh, film, you know, what led you to do to do it? Well, actually, um, I started filming my grandmother uh, when she turned 90. It was 1999, uh, so uh, more than 20 years ago. And I only wanted to film her in order to preserve her memory. I had no intention of making this particular film, but I wanted to, to have it on a private level. And um, I thought maybe I could make a film out of this material later, but I didn't see it at the time. And she, she would play with me in front of the camera, but she was not always ready to do it. Um, I didn't think I had enough material. Anyway, to make a long story short, I uh, filmed her over the course of five years and then she passed away. And it's only 10 years later, while I was in Berlin working as a filmmaker, that I actually uh, looked at these tapes that I had recorded back then. And then I said, how now with the distance and I have more experience, I want to do something about the condition of women in general, using her example. And I started uh, without money and I started to look into the archive material that I had and gathering everything that I could find about my grandmother. And I started editing a sort of biography of her, an objective biography. And I showed it to a friend, I remember, who is always a very fierce critic of my work. And she said, yeah, your grandmother is an interesting character, but the film is boring. And where is your point of view? as a filmmaker, but also as a grandson. And if you want to say something about the condition of women, then you will have to speak also about yourself. What was your relationship uh, with women, with your grandmother? And as a gay man, you probably also have something to say. So instead of making a portrait in an objective way of your grandmother, try to tell us more about the relationship you had. And I was saying, I, I spent a lot of time looking into the archive that I had, the family archive, and I found a lot of material um, where I was on screen also. And material, I had the sense that could tell the, the general rules of educating a boy. There were symbol, symbolic uh, images sometimes. They were very banal also, just family footage, but then, I understood also, I was like, what binds us? I need to, to put myself into this film, but how am I interesting? And I think my story is interesting only in so far that I had to break with the rules of my environment, of my family in order to be free. And I realized that's exactly what my grandmother had to do also two generations before. So we have very different uh, pathways and very different life stories, but these stories, uh, they join uh, in that matter. So I tried to focus uh, the film on the topic of gender. What makes us a woman or a man? And uh, why are we educated this way? What happens if we don't follow the pattern of becoming a man or becoming a woman? What does it mean? And it, it can be very superficial about the haircut, about the clothing, about the representation of, of gay people, of marginalized people. And I grew up in a very conservative environment and that had only one way of becoming a man, of being a man. And this is interesting enough, I understood a little bit better um, what values, what norms shaped me as a boy. And I realized looking back at this material also um, how I behaved. And for instance, what struck me was the little video, uh, the little videos that I was making with my friends, uh, with the Western movies or, or the fake news. Uh, and I realized that we were playing the machos. We were trying to affirm our masculine identity by playing the cowboys, the Westerns. We were beating each other. We were shooting at each other. And I saw a big violence in those images. There, we even um, 
rape a, a, a woman in the sports uh, section. There's like a multiple group rape sequence. It, it was all for fun. It was very naive. Um, but I realized one thing that boys, I tried to analyze this with a, with a sociological eye and with the distance. What do boys do on the weekend with a video camera? They play at representing themselves as strong men, like cowboys. And what do they do when they represent women? They portray them as ridicule. Women were either uh, the slut, the prostitute, uh, that is only interested in sex, the dirty girl, or the stupid housewife that does the laundry. And, and I saw these cliches, these images, and I thought it was very interesting. My own behavior, I analyzed my own behavior. I was like, okay, this is the way you become a man is by playing it the real guy, the tough guy, and by ridiculing the other gender, the feminine gender, and by extension, the homosexuals who are supposedly behaving like women so they're not real men so this was this topic that i thought was interesting and that this gender issues that are as well as in the the, the life story of my grandmother and also mine yeah you know i know we know each other so many years and when i saw the movie you know we never talked about our childhood yes. so when when i saw the movie i said oh my god it, you know it's very you, you you had very long way to go and it's yes it was different. a long way <laughs> because i didn't knew you know i didn't believe that this is you know i know you from the film you know from the festivals from parties in berlin you know hanging out you know um i never imagined that the guy that i know had yeah, yeah. This kind of education, you know, and it was a hidden past in a way. I mean, it, there's nothing to hide about, and I tell it all in the film now, but it's true. And it's amazing when I try to analyze my own story that I would say brainwashing works up until a certain extent. It can work very well. We're very clever, we human beings, at lying at ourselves. And I'm trying to fit in and to reproduce the expectations of our environment or our families. I mean, it starts with a, with a genuine feeling of wanting to fit in. So you want to be loved by your family. And the is interesting issue here is that we learn from a very, very early age, as we're babies and kids, how to adjust, how to adapt. And we are reminded that we need to behave in such a way. If you're a boy, you're supposed to do boy things. I mean, they're cliches, but they work very, very hard in our consciousness and subconscious also. You, you are not supposed to play with dolls. You're supposed to, and then as a boy, you go to the army as a, as a girl. I mean, in Israel, the girls go to the army too. But uh, yeah. in, in most countries, they don't. It's something reserved to, to men. But I thought that was very interesting to see how I tried to adapt to my environment following the rules because I wanted to be accepted, I wanted to be loved, I wanted to get a good job, I wanted to get rewarded and feel included in my group of friends. And you always have to prove that you're a real man in the language, in the daily situations, you always have to prove in order to be a man, that you are not behaving like a woman and that you are not a homosexual. These are the two things you constantly have to prove in order to be a good man. And in the small phrases, the, the words we use on a daily basis, the jokes, I mean, every homosexual or every queer person knows that starting from a point when you realize that you feel a little bit differently inside, you play the comedy. You have to lie. You have to, to pretend to uh, be somebody else. And this can be really damaging for the brain. And in my case, I mean, up until I was 18, 19 years old, I was behaving like a right-wing little arrogant brat that, that was unconscious of his privileges and that would just in order to affirm his identity as a male to be included, he would just 
in a gentle way. I mean, I was not a fascist or a crazy person. I would not beat up gay people or be mean to, to women, but just with these uh, little sentences we use, the words, you cannot use good words to describe homosexual people. You cannot, it's not acceptable. It was not even an option in my environment. Huh? Uh, it was 30, uh, 35 years ago that I was a teenager. So there was no way out for me. And gay people was only uh, related to AIDS, to, to sadness, to loneliness, to perversion, to sickness. And yeah, I, we know from a very early age that gay people exist. We know it from the language, but they're only faggots. There are only queers in the bad sense of the term, as we used to, to call them. Uh, in English also, and in French, uh, my mother tongue, there is a list like in every language of insults. So our identity basically is constructed at first with insults, with negative images. And of course, as a young boy, as a teenager, you don't always have the strength to overcome this and affirm a different identity, especially if you have no way to identify, if you have no role models, then, you know, I felt isolated, I felt ashamed, I thought I was the only one in the world. And even when I saw gay people on TV, it was very seldom at the time, but there was Michel Serrault in La Cage aux Folles in this famous French film that was turned into The Birdcage uh, in, in an American yes. film. This was pretty much the only reference um, but it's a ridicule, it's a ridiculous uh, character. You know, he's funny, but yeah. uh, I didn't want to be like that. And there was no way I could be gay and respectable. And I wanted to be respected in my environment. And also there was nobody gay or lesbian or bisexual or even at, at, at school, uh, nobody in my environment, you know, some rumors about some people or some politicians, but all the things that you don't want to be. And I was saying brainwashing works because although I had these homosexual feelings and, and these, uh, their feelings also, they're not only sexual pulsions, but I was in love with a boy, but I, I could not understand it. And I was like, okay, and when I understood it with 17, 18, 19, I, I was like, okay, I have this special inclination, uh, but it's, it has to remain a secret. It can never be told. And then, interesting enough to analyze also with the distance, the more you repress your own feelings, the sooner you start finding scapegoats and uh, trying to oppress another category of people in order to make you exist a little, bit, a little bit more. I think it's almost a systemic way that we see all over the planet in different social groups and interactions when you're not at ease with your own self, with your sexuality, most of the time, you repress it. And then what do you do? You start beating up uh, uh, gay boys because you don't want to be like them because they maybe they remind you of who you are. And yeah. so you want to distance yourself from them and you start to create a fake identity, very often associated with violence, or you hang on to patriarchal structures where you have a, a power position and, and you don't want to let go of that position and then you start to discriminate uh, women or fags or homosexual peoples in your discourse, in your speech, in order to distance yourself. And anyway, it took some time. I had to go to New York uh, uh, very far away from home and discover a new reality. And all of a sudden, when I was 19, 20, I was like, oh my God, there are actually millions of people like me all around the world. Nobody ever told me. I'm telling you, this was 30, 35 years ago. So there was no internet. There was nothing in the paper. There was nothing in the school books. There was just illusions here and there. And this was like a shock in my mind. This was a revelation. I was like, and I understood what it meant also politically. And then I started to cultivate myself, to educate myself, to buy books. And I must say books and movies are the two cultural items that helped me find a new identity and be comfortable with that identity. And then to relate, I found the LGBT movement 
And immediately, almost overnight, I engaged, uh, I became a, a, an activist. Uh, I started writing for the local uh, gay newspaper in Geneva. I discovered that there were people actually in my hometown also when I got back from New York. And this was a revelation, but these activities were never made public. And this was the early 90s. And then, you know, I became an activist and I contributed also in my country to more visibility. And I think that's the key for me and my, my philosophy as an activist um, is the visibility. And also with that film, this is something I realized a little bit later, but I think it took me time also to understand the links between homophobia and sexism and sexism and gender play and gender roles. And I think if we expanded if we allowed ourselves to expand our understanding of what a man can be and what a woman can be, if we see that gender is a social construct in many ways and that it can be overcome, it can be extended to take the cliches again, if you're a little girl with short hair and you like to play soccer, why are you always being called a tomboy immediately? and excluded from girl socializing. And the same with the, the little boy that wants to dance. You know, there are big cliches, but they still work in, in people's minds. And we have to overcome this and then realize that there is more than one possible identity as a woman and as a man. And now they're more and more visible, but there's a, a whole trans identity also that there's something in between and that actually normality resides precisely there, in my opinion, in that diversity. We are not abnormal. We are not not normal. What is normal is that on every segment of 100 people all over the world, that there will always be 60, 70 that uh, identify as straight, then 20, 30 that identify as bisexual in their behavior, they have sex with men, but maybe they're straight. Then five to 10% that they're, they're gay or lesbian exclusively. And one to three people out of the hundred that identify as trans, or maybe even more now because people are coming out because the possibility of these new identities exist. So people sometimes say, oh, there are more and more of these LGBT people all over. It's like, yes, they were always there, but finally they come out of the closet and they affirm who they are. And I think it's a key understanding. It's a very political thing. And this is why we are being repressed also because people or regimes are uh, feeling that they're losing control over their people. The religion is feeling that they're losing control. We're not following the rules anymore, but we're being ourselves. And when I see there's so much happiness when, 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 you, when we are together with oneself and with others that are trying or succeeding in being themselves, so much more happiness than in fake identities of being only straight or being homophobic or being this and that. So this was a very important understanding in, in my life philosophy, if you want, that I wanted to translate into this film. Yeah. Long answer, right? <laughs> yes, you know, um, and you know, I think that your uh, journey to uh, recognize yourself is a little bit uh, the journey of Switzerland in the same time, you know? Yes, there are some parallels because it's also the portrait of a, a specific time. I mean, my film goes with my grandmother. It's actually almost over a century. It starts, she was born in 1909, you know, with a father that was born in 1855 in the north of Italy. And it sort of concludes with me in the year 2000. And so it's almost a century of a, of a family. There's a lifespan there of 100 years. And you see the, the different times also, uh, what women were not allowed to do, and then the LGBT situation slowly, uh, what was the reality? And then, you know, it was very interesting when I found those tapes again that I shot uh, uh, with my neighbors and my brothers, these Westerns, but also the news. We talk about AIDS. 
you know, the new virus, it was present. I was 13 years old and it was very naive the way we, we took it and put it into our little films that we were just doing for fun. But you can see how we perceived that reality and what we made of it. And, uh, you know, it, it was true what I say in the film also that uh, I didn't hate gay people. I was just ignorant. And I, you know, when I was filming them on Fifth Avenue, there's a sequence in the film, this is really amazing, uh, that I, I realized many years later that I actually had filmed this gay pride parade when I was 15 and it was confronted to thousands of LGBT people. There was even Marsha P. Johnson that waves at me in the film. I didn't know who she was. I only realized that it was Marsha P. Johnson once the editing of the film was over. I didn't even know. <laughs> it was so After she interesting. died already. After she died. And in 87, when I filmed her, um, well, she was marching down Fifth Avenue in that parade. And in my head, I was going, I'm, I'm not like them, but I feel rather pity for them because they're dying of AIDS. It must be horrible. It was a very naive thought, but there was a, no way that I could associate myself with these people because I didn't want to die from AIDS and I was a normal boy. I was a, I was a good boy like I try to say in the film, and I always try to behave that way. Now I became a very bad boy, but thank God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I have them, we are, I have the same, um, not the same, but I remember when I was uh, 13 and 12 and, um, and uh, eight, you know, start to be in the news. I remember when um, I was watching a Dian dynasty and Rock yes. son uh, um, died from AIDS in the same time. And, you know, I saw it uh, in TV and the guy that I know from TV in the news, they're talking about him that he's died from AIDS. So it was really, you know, shocking because I understood that as a kid, I'm, at, I'm, at, I'm attracted to boys, you know? Yeah. So uh, I understood that I belong to this section, but uh, to this area of life, but I didn't add uh, any bad feelings for gay people. I was uh, curious. I had the opposite from you. I was yeah. curious to see how, how it's going to develop. <laughs> yeah. I was very afraid and I was pretty convinced that I was going to lose everything I had because although my, my family was not, they're, they're not religious, they're not fanatics. They're, it was a conservative family, but there were warm hearted people. They were nice people and they're still are very nice people. Now they opened up with the, to the LGBT question. They support it, they support me. They voted yes to the gay, gay marriage in, in Switzerland. They're very open, my parents now, because they didn't have any information. And so their system of beliefs was based on this, patriarchal pyramid where everybody has its place and you know white men are up there it doesn't even we don't even talk about gay people or queer people there mm. they're only men and women and then there's the rest of the people that are scumbags or that are uninteresting people or dangerous people or misfits you know so it's uh police some action in my street <laughs> But um, what was I saying? It disturbed me. Uh, that your family, uh, uh, they did that there is men and women. Yeah, yeah, there was, there was, there was only this very rigid category. Uh, I mean, I said it before and um, I had no way to identify and I was very, very afraid I would lose all these privileges. I knew I was a privileged boy, you know, I was watching television and then you had little black boys uh, dying of hunger in Ethiopia at the time. You had a, a war in Lebanon, uh, you had wars all over and I was like, oh, I live in Switzerland. This is like the best country in the world. We're peaceful, we're neutral. We are not in America, we're not in Russia. Uh, I know we were rich, that there were 
poorer people. So I'm like, I have all the advantages in life. And all of a sudden I, I was on the top of the scale, if you want, of privileges. And then boom, you fall down because I was only a fag. I was a faggot. And with that stamp or stempel on my, on my head, uh, I would lose all these privilege, the privileges. Then I realized that with some work of activism and uh, explanations and information, um, I could maybe convince my environment that I wasn't such a horrible person, that we were not perverts, that we would not attack children, that because, and you had to unbuild or to break all these prejudices and the taboos. And I realized that actually 99% of the people in my environment accepted me how I was. They were sensitive to my speech. They were like, actually, you're right. And they started to work with themselves also with their own prejudices. I didn't lose any friends. I mostly attracted people that were curious to know more. I was like, that's very interesting. So you had to hide and what does it mean? And then they compared their own lives. I was like, oh, it must not have been easy. Then you encourage other people to come out also. And this is really something that I've witnessed in my private life and which encouraged me very quickly to become an activist because I said, if I can move just 10 people in my little family and circle of friends, then, you know, at university, I organized a public panel discussion, then I can move a couple of hundred. And then if I write an article in the paper, people can relate and I will put a face. I will not hide anymore. I will be proud. So uh, this pride feeling was very, important also this is why we call the gay pride i mean everybody knows that now but it's it it's in opposition to the shame we were feeling all the time we were supposed to be ashamed of this because people yeah. made us feel ashamed because religious leaders or political leaders said it was something to be ashamed of and this you have to reverse in your head and something to be proud and visible and this visibility was Again, a key concept in my activism, and I said, every time somebody's going to see me, then, or hear what I say, then they won't be going on saying, oh, we don't know any gay people. No, and I want to try to give some kind of positive example and, and be a kind person and live a good life and be free also. And... I did that as an activist. And now this film is, a, and also a, it's, a, it's a very personal film, but it's a political film. And, and I was very touched that in Switzerland, for instance, I made a tour, I, I went to 25 cities when it came out to the cinemas. And the audience was mostly mainstream, more straight audiences. There were parents there, I mean, it's an art house film. No, it, it was yeah. not a blockbuster. But the people who came to see the movie were genuinely interested and curious. And they were always touched. And basically, I've had hundreds of testimonies, but also in Taiwan or in New York or in Italy or in France or in Germany. I showed the film in many, many places. And everybody says, thank you for sharing. Sh thank you for telling the truth. This we can relate to. Thank you for being so honest. Thank you for sharing your family because we could reflect also our own uh, family stories. And apparently that's what people told me. This is a film that opens dialogue somehow that allows people to break some taboos with themselves or with other people. And I've heard a lot of people who came to see the movie that came home afterwards and then wrote me an email and said, oh, thank you, because thanks to your movie, um, I could open up to my parents. Or a mother would write me, oh, but thank you, because it made me understand my gay son a lot better. And or young mothers, like I have two seven-year-old uh, kids and they're twins and I was just wondering, am I giving, the, uh, giving them a, a sexist or homophobic education? I don't want that to happen. So thank you for pointing out at the education norms also that we use to educate our kids. 
So it was very rewarding for me. It's the best thing you can hear as a filmmaker. If, if you touch people or if people yeah. cry, I've had lots of testimonies like that also. So it makes me really happy. And I see that it's not a vain uh, uh, issue that to say the truth, to tell the truth and to try to be honest and visible and show your true feelings, it inspires other people. And I think if we could extend this in some kind of magical way around the planet, I'm not saying that my film Madame uh, will uh, conquer the planet or change the world, but little by little, if everybody does that in his or her environment and opens up and usually something good comes back, you know? Sometimes the, the, the political regime doesn't allow it. Sometimes it can destroy you also. And we know of too many tragic uh, lives uh, that have been lost uh, because of that, because of repression. And it goes on, you know, in Russia, it goes on also in Israel, in the right wing. I mean, Israel is a very open-minded, but we have these dark forces that somehow want to try to make us shut up or be somebody that we are not. And I think it's a disgrace and that we need to fight for freedom more and more and more than ever. And actually it works. It works. Um, usually when we succeed, it works. <laughs> yeah, you know, and your movie is, I think, um, one of the things that, um, you know, straight people or other straight people um, are going, they're going to see the story of your grandmother and they're discovering their in very, as you said, very political and social movie about LGBT rights, about women rights, you know? Yeah, so, it's very interesting because I had a lot of straight people also uh, coming up to me after the screening or people my age or younger people and said, it's so interesting because it's sort of, it's my story too. It's your very personal specific story, but uh, it's my story also but I'm not gay, but I had issues also in my education where I had to hide, I had to come out, maybe not as dramatically as, as sometimes it can be for uh, LGBT people, but uh, I don't know, I wanted to play the guitar and my parents forced me to play the piano. And I, or actually they identify also in my film specifically because this is a film told from the point of view of a straight boy. I mean, of course I'm gay now, but the story is told for maybe three quarters of the film. I am head, I'm socialized in a heteronormative way like most people are. So this is a way for people to identify. And then I take, I, my feelings are different. So I, I embrace a new identity. They don't, but they can relate to that so they can understand better because it's told from the inside. And this is what I wanted to say is like, and try to gather also all these little situations that almost everybody experiences in his family or at school or how we behave with, uh, with our peers, with our boy, boy uh, group of friends or with the girls, you're supposed to seduce the girls, all these little things that we all have to go through either by embracing them or by distancing yourself from them. But you cannot be indifferent to all these things. Yeah, and I want to, to talk a little bit about um, the technical process because it's uh, how many hours of archive you had and um, did, did the archive help you to create to write the story? Did, did you have the story in mind and then build it for the archive or did you look the archive and then said, okay, this is going to be the story? Do you understand what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. I, uh, I gathered more than 100 hours of material and um, I had the chance and the privilege that my dad filmed us a lot uh, with the Super 8 camera in the 70s and 80s. And then um, I took over when I was 13 in 1985, when we had our first video camera. It was very new at the time and I was fascinated by it. Yeah. So uh, I filmed also uh, quite some hours with this. There are lots of photographies. 
there was less material about my grandmother, but there was the material that I filmed her when she was older. And this was precious also. And uh, with a distance of 15, 20 years also. So it's always interesting to, to look back at the material. And indeed, it, it was a game of going back and forth. Um, like I said, my early concept was to do only something about my grandmother. And then I included myself. And then I was checking the material. I was like, what could be relevant? What is not to the subject of gender? And then I must admit that I got lost on the way many times because I was getting too emotional because there are these, these memories uh, are very strong. This is my own personal life. And I would get lost. I said, I thought some sequence was important just because it was beautiful or it resonated. It was very important emotionally for me. But then I had the chance to have a team also, my editor and my assistant, who would remind me of my topic and said, no, Stefan, this is not relevant. This might be important in your life, but it's not relevant for the film. Yeah. Don't forget, we are making a film about gender issues and we are using you and your grandmother and your family members as film characters. So my uh, wish was to stay as close as possible to the truth. I wanted to be authentic. It was like, I want to tell the truth. I want to say things exactly how they happened. But sometimes we had to make shortcuts because you cannot, otherwise it would be an eight hour long film and it would be super boring. Or it would be at least a different kind of film. It could be maybe experimental, but I wanted to do a 90 minute film that was a feature, but that was also entertaining. My big fear was to bore people. And you know that probably also, there's nothing worse than to look at uh, private family films uh, from your neighbor or even sometimes from your own family. But if you don't know the people on screen, you're like, why should I watch this? this is, we fall asleep immediately usually. So I, I, I was trying to find the right distance with the material and to stay close to my topic, which was gender and eliminate all the things that were not there. And then it was a, a game that was going back and forth for many, many months, even years actually. I had to stop the production twice because I ran out of money. And then I had to gather new financing and, and I found a little bit. And also I must say it helped me take the, the necessary distance also because I didn't know at some point of the production, I didn't know what I was wanted to tell. So like, and sometimes I was also depressed and I mean, depressed is a big word, but uh, I, I was like, I was afraid also, I was like, I'm going to be ridiculous just talking about my grandmother and, and filming myself. It's outrageous. Who's going to, nobody's going to be interested in this. It's just narcissistic and people are going to laugh at me. I was a little bit afraid of that. And then I said, no. And my team again convinced me. It was like, Stefan, you have quite some amazing material. And if we find the right distance for it, for the film not to sound like too narcissistic and, and look at how fantastic my life is and so on. Um, also, except for my coming out, if you want, I have a very privileged life. So, you know, a lot of people said to me also hearing about the projects and like, yeah, you want to tell about your life, but what's your big problem in life? That your grandma didn't, didn't accept your homosexuality for like two days? but you have a wonderful grandma, you have good parents, you have a nice life, you're privileged, you're educated. Uh, you know, I'm not a transgender uh, Brazilian Latina girl that was born in the favelas of Sao Paulo or, or Rio and that had to fight uh, to, in order to exist. But I said, I have my share of problems too. I, I had to find a way to become myself even in a privileged environment. And this, I think, is a universal story. 
is not only for privileged people, everybody has to find a way to become yourself, oneself. And uh, maybe that hopefully some people can identify with, but this was my, my biggest fear, yeah. And I said back and forth for many, many months between image and text also. This was the, how do we put the text on the images? I tried not to describe the pictures. Sometimes it needed an explanation, sometimes not. Uh, sometimes it needed another level of narration. And then I added some music also, which would add another level still. And this sort of complexity, I think, makes the film happening. And the rhythm also was very important to me. I didn't want people to be bored. Sometimes it's quiet. Sometimes it's a, there's a, there's more action. Uh, sometimes it, go, it goes very, very fast. And I had to come to terms with my own biography because it's so funny. People come out of the theaters most of the time. They saw my film. I've had this dozens of times. I can, I can relate it. And they have the feeling that they know everything about me. And they see me on stage and then they come up to me and we have a drink and we talk and we chat. And I'm telling them, you know, this is only, of course, everything that I say in the film is true, but there are a lot of things that I did not say. And uh, thank God I, I, I kept some secrets um, for myself, to myself. Um, but I, I had no problem with sharing this if it can help also other people to understand their environment and themselves a little bit better. That was my only aim. Um, yeah, maybe in the next feature, Stefan. <laughs> yeah, picture. well, it's I'm movie. working on a fiction project right now and, okay. and I will put a lot of myself too uh, in that project. And in a fiction, you can disguise it a little easier. It's not you. But I think any filmmaker that makes some interesting film puts a lot of himself or, or herself in, into the film or into his characters. I think it's important to be personal uh, to be in order to be relevant. I'm happy to hear that you're going to do fiction because uh, we met uh, because of your uh, Perora. Your, yes. Your, yes. Yeah, I actually only did one short film of fiction, which amazingly also is, uh, is still a hit on, the, on YouTube. It has millions and millions of views. I think it's 6.5 millions now, and I put it online only three years ago, and it, it traveled all over the world. I would never have thought that this film, and I'm very happy about this, not to boast about the, 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 the success of the film, but for instance, this allows a lot of young kids that are 13, 14, 15, 16 in countries where they have no role models. And now, thanks to YouTube, they can have access to LGBT content. And Prora is, is a film that is viewed, I see the statistics in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Brazil. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands and I have thousands of comments also and it's almost a, a forum where young people come to find uh, love also and try to meet other people. It's like a dating app almost in, in some micro level sometimes, but it's really funny to observe. And this is something that I was missing when I was a teenager. There was no way, there was no internet, there was nothing, there was, I had no example. And if I had seen a film like this one, when I was 15, I think it would have opened my world and changed my life yes. much earlier. Um, so I want to ask, what is the most significant thing you're taking from the process of making Madame? Ha, huh. the most significant thing oh. I took uh, from, from all the process, because it's very long process and, and... I was gonna say patience. <laughs> <laughs> patience and to be, to persevere, to, to be perseverant, uh, to never abandon, because this project, like most projects, but this one in particular was very personal and 
I had to wait three years until I had some financing. At first I was rejected twice and they said, oh, we don't care this story about your grandmother, who cares about that? And I was like, I was rejected. Finally, I got it at the third attempt. Then I ran out of money again. Then I got lost in the editorial process also. What do I want to say? And I remember telling my teammates, my editor and my sister, it was, it was a very small, small team, but we were together for a long period of time. And I was telling them, remember, it's still not there. I'm not happy with the result. I don't know what I'm saying anymore, but we are a little bit closer to the result. So we keep fighting, we keep working because every day, Sometimes there's a backslash, you have the feeling you go back and it was better the day before, but that sequence doesn't work or why am I saying this? But I was saying, in German, we say dranbleiben. Keep, at the, keep being at the thing, keep working on it, keep working on it and someday you will succeed. And this is something my grandmother also uh, would teach me and that I think is palpable. Uh, uh, you can feel in, in the movie, her incredible uh, personality, her curiosity, but her will to work in order to achieve her goal, to get there. She will never let go until she was satisfied with uh, what she wanted. And uh, I think I took over from her and this is probably the lesson I will take from this film. Now I'm in the process of writing a, a, a feature fiction and I have the feeling that I'm at the very bottom of a big, big mountain, but I know that it's gonna take probably two, three or more years, but I have to keep in mind that someday I will get there if I work hard enough and if I work good enough also, because it's not only hard work, it's good work that you have to produce. <laughs> I want to thank you very, very much. Well, so, thank you, Yain, and it, it's uh, for me to thank you for selecting the film. And I have to thank also the, the, the Swiss Embassy uh, in Israel and uh, Swiss, Swiss films uh, that supported me. And I wish I could have been there uh, with you and with all the fantastic audience of Til Mefest, but hopefully with the, with, the, with the next film, maybe. Yes, yes. And yeah, you know, your, your movie because uh, I selected your movie, um, now we have a, a focus for, for, for Swiss movies, so... Oh, it started like that? Okay, well, great. <laughs> so now we well, have... They yeah. should do it every year. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you started something good over here, we're exposing more well, movies. I'm very happy if I could contribute, so the best. <laughs> <laughs> so, danke schön, thank you very much. Danke dir. Thank you. And, and shalom. Shalom. And keep, keep in touch. Keep bye the bye. good work. Bye-bye. Take care.